Welcome to Maroon's Tuesday Night Live at Mac and Bob's in Salem, Virginia, with your hosts, Nick the Sanctus and Richmond Bramblett. Mac and Bob's opened for business in 1980. Over the years, we've grown from 10 stools to a full-service restaurant that seats 330 people. Now we invite you to come try our new breakfast menu, featuring sweet potato pancakes, eggs benedict, omelets made to order, stuffed French toast, homemade sausage and gravy biscuits, and much more. Open for breakfast Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m., Sunday brunch, 10 a.m. till 2. See you for breakfast at Mac and Bob's in Salem. Like to welcome back Coach Allison, who we haven't seen in a couple months. Soccer season <laughs> ends and Allison goes away. Actually, just returned from Indianapolis in the NCAA convention, where, amongst other things, you got some new news about recruiting and things you can and can't do. Would you like to share with us? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, back um, I guess it was four or five years ago. I think uh, um, you know legislation was on the docket to um, it to be able to handle social media uh, and 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 be able to handle technology. And uh, yeah, at that time, we as a, as a body voted to not allow texting to recruits. And um, at that time, I even thought that was that might have been a mistake because so many kids were just starting. And I had, I had children myself that would, you know, were just getting into texting, and that's how they communicated. And I really felt like we, we might have been making a, a wrong decision at that time. But I, I think with the proliferation of, uh, of droids and iPhones and everybody doing email on the phones, I think we kind of softened our stance on that. And the NCAA... Division three body did enact legislation that allows coaches now to reach out to student prospective student athletes 
uh, by manner of text. And I think <laughs> you'll see a lot more of, uh, of, of that out there now. And my dad's about your age, and he kind of struggles with text messages. Where are you at on that scale? So uh, you know, I, I've gotten used to it. I actually I, I enjoy it. It's a, it's a you know, one of the things that I found with, with, with younger people is, you know, long, <laughs> long communication really doesn't work. Everything needs to be short and sweet, and everybody's in kind of a hurry. And uh, yeah, I've, I've gotten into the texting. I actually enjoy it. <laughs> Now, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, or SAC for short, is back in full effect for this school year with uh, the athletic teams being recognized at Maroon Madness back in early December. They also have some other opportunities coming up in the spring that their members will be participating in as we move forward with the semester. Could you tell us about some of those opportunities and things to look for? Well, a couple of, of significant initiatives that the Student Athlete Advisory Committee will be involved in. Um, we're um, conducting an external um, review. We try to do that every so often. And, uh, um, yeah, most of the departments on campus try to do that every so often. We have uh, some you know, <clears throat> some colleagues coming in to evaluate our operation, to give us some recommendations on how we can improve our operation. The Student Athlete Advisory Committee will be heavily involved in that. In addition to to meeting with the uh, uh, with the external evaluators, they'll have a chance to uh, to pick their brain as well in, in, in the whole process. And I know they're um, I know they're going to be excited about being a part of that progress uh, that process, and because. Um, uh, they're what we're all about, you know, you know, making sure that their experience is a good one. In addition to that, uh, Roanoke College, just like every other uh, Division three school out there, um, is connected with Special Olympics. And um, you'll see involvement with not only Student Athlete Advisory Committee, but also a lot of our teams this year um, in doing some things with the Special Olympics, ranging from stu uh, Special Olympics athletes coming to our games, to clinics, uh, to spending quality time at the bowling alley with them. But uh, yeah, that, that's a big initiative for, for the Student Athlete Advisory Committee this, this coming spring. How did the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, as well as the college athletic department, get involved with Special Olympics? How do we do, how do we get involved with them? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I mean, it, you know, last year we voted um, at the NCAA convention. Last year we adopted the uh, Special Olympics as a, a Division Three initiative for all schools to get involved. And uh, the conference took the lead and reached out to the Virginia Special Olympics, uh, you know, Rick Jeffries and, and, and Jeff Robinson and, and uh, excuse me Scott Robinson and um, yeah you know, all the people that uh, that work with uh, Special Olympics have been in contact with every ODAC school. And it, is, it hasn't been a, uh, an ODAC campus that hasn't done something so far. So we're, you know, we're excited about this. It's a great opportunity for our student athletes to give back a little bit. And uh, the Special Olympics kids really, uh, uh, the Special Olympics athletes really appreciate being around our athletes. In addition to that, the people at Special Olympics are always so, so thankful for whatever we can do. Now, the Hall of Fame candidates for this year's class, Class of 2012, have been finalized. Obviously, we can't release those names until Alumni Weekend rolls around in April. But the Hall of Fame, really an honor for any athlete here at Roanoke. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's one way for us to celebrate the rich tradition of success that we've enjoyed at Roanoke College. When people think of what we've accomplished uh, at Roanoke College and intercollegiate athletics with the NCAA Division II uh, National Championship in basketball and NCAA Division II slash three National Championship in lacrosse. Uh, you know, soccer teams in the 60s dominated the state of Virginia. Um, you got the five smart boys, you know, you know, back in the back in the late 30s who, gosh, made a national run um, to the track and field success that we've had recently, and and, and Robin Yerkes and Casey Smith winning national championships. Um, the Hall of Fame allows us to bring those athletes back to campus and celebrate what they did for Rono College at that time. And it, it gives them an opportunity to come back to their alma mater and enjoy the campus and enjoy the whole feeling. And uh, it's just a, it's a great way to uh, uh, celebrate our legacy. Now this year's class, very unique. What makes this class so special and different from some of the ones that have come well, I before? Uh, I, what we're mo <laughs> Okay, I can't say that we're most excited, but we, what we're very, very excited about is and the members of the 1972 National Championship basketball team will be hearing about this soon. We're going to honor them uh, as part of our Hall of Fame procedures, and we'll be reaching out to them here in the coming weeks and, and, and trying to get the best turnout we possibly can and, uh, uh, and honor them in a real special way. And We're, we're excited about that. We'll have, we might have another surprise or two at the Hall of Fame induction. I'm sure I'll be there shifting gears a little bit. Here in the Sports Information Office, the coming weeks, things get really busy. Seasons start to overlap. What would you say for you is the toughest season overall? On an annual basis, I mean, both for Brad and I, I think that the spring season is, 
is so difficult to get out and be as visible as we want to be because we're, we're stretched with men's lacrosse and women's lacrosse and softball and baseball, you know, track and field kids, um, yeah, you know, the two tennises, the golf. I mean, it's, it's hard to get out and, uh, and, and make sure that, that we're around and the kids see us and uh, uh, we're visible. And we, we're able to put on a first-class event, too, while we're, and we're doing so. I, we've, historically, I would say that the spring has always been the toughest for both Brad and I. It's a, it's a heck of a lot of work. I, I'm sure he's done it, and I, I did it the other night. We, we took a look at our schedules, and I think March 3rd is probably the only date that I can think of where we don't really have a game. We've got a scrimmage on the 11th. That's probably the only other one that uh, the scrimmage on the 11th of February that uh, um, I know Brad is going to be warming up his stat crew and everything. Yeah, you really don't get a break on the weekends. And you, we find, too, that a lot of coaches are having Sunday games now. Uh, so you really don't get much of a break in a weekend. If, if February is historically a, a tough month for us as well because we got all the spring sports getting started and we're wrapping up basketball and, and, and track and field. So, yeah, definitely the, the spring semester as an athletic director is a bit more difficult. Some would look at me and, and the fact that I'm soccer coach and AD during those years. I got such a wonderful staff. Brad does a tremendous job, and you know Paige and Susan and Bill, everybody just, just pitches in to uh, to help us get through and allow me to you know, to coach my team and give those guys the experience that they deserve. And uh, but I do think that you know it, the falls is, is easier just because I have such a good staff. But the spring is uh, um, it's a labor of love. I, don't, I wouldn't call it you know, a, a, a difficult one because it's. Uh, yeah, when you love what you do, you don't feel like it's difficult. Absolutely. Coach, thanks so much Greg, for taking Nick, the time. Uh, we really thanks for all it. you've done for Rono College. And I know your, 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 uh, your academic career is waning here. It won't be long before you're walking across the stage. And, gosh, for all that you've done for Rono College Athletics, we sure appreciate it. You've been phenomenal. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Richmond, we'll be right back with Radford Women's Basketball Assistant Coach Katrina Williams. Be sure to catch Roanoke College Sports on Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7 in Roanoke, Salem, Botetourt, Lexington, and Blacksburg. Brought to you by Mac and Bob's Main Street, Salem. For programming information or schedules, go to valleyvisiontv.com. For information or schedules on Valley Vision TV programs, visit us on the internet at valleyvisiontv.com. Remember, you're watching the Valley's only true local network, Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7. Bradford's women's assistant basketball coach, Katrina Williams. Now, welcome back to the show. Uh, now, last time we had you on, we talked about your high school and college days at both Glenvar and Roanoke College. But now we're discussing your coaching career, which spans nearly eight years. Uh, with that said, when did you know that you wanted to be a coach? First of all, saying that I've been coaching for eight years kind of makes me feel old. <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, once I got into college, or once I got started playing basketball and got serious about it. I knew that it was something that I wanted to do um, for my life. I wanted, you know, to be a part of it as, as long as I could. And um, coaching is the closest thing you can get to, to your playing days. Sure. And, um, and like I said, when you're passionate about something, you, you know, you want to do it for, for a long time. Absolutely. And you got your start at Ferrum College under Brian Harvey, uh, who coached you at one point. Uh, you're an integral part of, the, of that staff that brought the Panthers a recruiting class, which included 11 freshmen uh, in the uh, 2007, or correction, the 2007 USA South Conference Rookie of the Year. That's a lot of players, you know, for a basketball player, for a basketball program to bring in and such a successful one as well. Did you feel right at home in your first year coaching at Ferrum? Um, I did. Uh, Coach Harvey, he, he did. He coached me in high school. He was uh, part of, he was part of my family. And um, he was a big part of my, you know, my growth as a basketball player and as a person. And um, there's no, nowhere, no person I would have rather started my career with than with him at Ferrum. And, um, you know, Ferrum's a great place. I don't know if you know much about it, but it's, it's a place that you step on campus and you automatically feel at home. And um, to be able to, you know, 
to be with him and to and to be there, you know, it's it was a, a special start. And you also helped Harvey lead the Panthers to a 21 and 7 record in 2006 and 2007 in your second season, uh, which was a school record. Uh, this team also broke school records in scoring. Key players on that team included forward uh, Aline Alzheim and uh, guard Tanya Wright, while Harvey was named USA South Conference Coach of the Year. The Panthers went to back-to-back -back conference tournament championship games in your two years at Ferrum. How did your experience at Ferrum prepare you for your first head coaching position? Um, I'll be honest. I'm not, I'm not sure that I was 100% prepared, and I, I don't know how you, you, you know you're 100% prepared for that. I was, I was a young coach. I, um, I had an opportunity to step in, like I said, when I was young, but having a chance to work with Coach Harvey, who he let me do a lot. I mean, he let me get my hands in on, um, you know, in on recruiting. He let me get my hands in on things at practice. And uh, to actually have an opportunity to coach and be a part of building that program and, and building the tradition that he's carrying on now um, help you know, help me, help me, help prepare me. But also being able to coach in the same conference and getting a chance to uh, know the other teams in the league and getting a chance to, you know, just to become familiar with the league, I think, was, was, a, big, was a big help as well. Is that something that – uh, even though you, you think you, you've seen everything and you've, you've experienced everything, once you get that head coaching position, there are just some things that you didn't expect? There are some things that you're not going to be prepared for until you're actually put in that situation. Uh, absolutely. Now you took over a program <clears throat> at Averett uh, that didn't win a single game prior to your arrival, uh, and in just three seasons you elevated the program to new heights, including a school record 17-9 and overall mark in 2009 and 2010. Uh, which topped the previous school standard set the year before. In addition to the overall record, the Cougars set a new program record for conference wins in each of your three years at the helm. Uh, now, this must have been kind of an enjoyable time uh, for you to watch the program grow so quickly. Um, well, it, it was. It was a. It was so enjoyable. It was an experience that I'm. Um, will forever be grateful for. It's an experience that I will keep close to me and to my heart forever. Uh, but I owe that to the kids. I mean, honest to goodness, I mean, I, I stepped in and, and they were ready for change and they embraced, embraced it. And uh, they were willing to do whatever was asked of them and they wanted to win. And that was the bottom line. And, um, and, and they did. And, you know, it, it makes me proud to see now they're, you know, they're, they're, they're successful now. And, and that's, that's exciting for me because the kids that are seniors now are kids that I brought in. And um, so it's been fun and it's still fun to see them, to see them continue to be successful. Now, after five years uh, at the Division Three level, you took over a position, or you took a position uh, as the director of basketball operations at Radford University. And uh, now, in this position, uh, you're not allowed to be a part of the coaching staff, uh, but have to work in as an extension of the coaching staff. Could you tell us a little about this position and and kind of what it what it entails? Uh, the director of basketball operations is a position that you, you're you're doing all of the day-to-day -day work of the program. You're what makes the program run. You're the one that does um, the travel and uh, all of the uh, the inside work, you know, the stuff that the behind-the-scenes stuff that, that you don't see. And um, it was tough for me, honestly, because I absolutely wanted to coach Division One basketball. And, and having an opportunity to get into Division One basketball is not something that is easy. It's not something that, you know – it's tough. It's tough to get into. Sure. And sometimes you have to do it in any way possible. And it was a chance for me to get my foot in the door, uh, not only to get my foot into the door, but to be close to home. I mean, that's where I grew up. Um, but it was it was definitely an eye-opener for me to, you know, to go from being a head coach and having my own program and, and doing things the way that I was used to doing them, then to stepping back and not even really being able to coach basketball and doing them, you know, someone else's right. way. Um, but, you know, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity because now it's given me the opportunity to do what I'm doing now. Sure. Now, in the summer of 2011, you were promoted to assistant women's basketball coach. Uh, this coming after a much improved season as the Highlanders had an eight-game turnaround and finished 11-5 and in the Big South Conference. Uh, the team is currently 8-10 and this season, including 6-4 and four at home after a convincing win over Presbyterian last night. Can you tell us the difference, differences coaching this season from last season when you couldn't be involved in the coaching aspects as, as director of basketball operations? That, that's the biggest difference yeah. is now I have a chance to coach. Now I have a chance to have my hands in the things on the floor. Um, you know, now, now when we're in timeouts, I'm able to talk about things that we should do with uh, – 
you know, strategically or, you know, and, and now I'm able to, to develop players. And that was something that I missed last year is actually having a chance to get on the floor and, and coach them. And, um, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. You know, that's what we're all in this for sure. is to actually develop players, not only as basketball players, but as people. And that was, that was, that's what I want to do. And, um, so now having the opportunity to do that again, it's, you know, it's great. We have a great group of kids who, who I love. I mean, they're, um, they want to get better every day and, you know, they're, they're begging for us to be on the floor with them. And that's, that's awesome. So. Now this will be the first season for you, uh, bring your recruiting class to Radford. How is it different from your perspective coaching at the division one level to the division three level, especially, um, uh, as recruiting is, is an, is a factor. Uh, re recruiting is completely different. Uh, <laughs> you know, my, the entire month of July, I, you're, you're not at home. You're on the road traveling from event to event, whereas at the Division three level, I mean, most of your recruiting is done locally. And now at the Division one level, your recruiting is done nationally. And um, it's, you know, it's a little bit easier to recruit when you have, you know, you have money to give kids instead of saying, hey, I really want you to come be a part of our program. But, by the way, you know, can you pay to come to school? Sure. <laughs> uh, but – uh, the time of recruiting is completely different. Um, the amount of work that goes into recruiting is different. I mean, your recruiting never stops. I mean, it's day to day, every single day you're doing something with recruiting, and um, and that's that's the way that it has to be to, to really in kids. Well, Coach, good luck with the rest of your season, and thanks Thank for coming back on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back in just one moment uh, with the chair of the chemistry department, Gary Hollins. And we're back with the chair of the chemistry department, Gary Hollis. Now, first of all, welcome to, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Now, we are glad to have you not only as a member of the chemistry department, but also as a fan of Roanoke College Athletics and Roanoke College Basketball. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your position entails here at Roanoke College? Well, I'm a member of the chemistry department, and my specialty is organic chemistry. So that's the chemistry of carbon compounds. Um, all the students who go to pre-medical aspirations, medical school, dental school, pharmacy, have to take two semesters of that organic chemistry, and our biology majors and biochemistry majors do, so I get to see lots of students at Roanoke College. Sure. Now, as a North Carolina native, uh, just outside of Charlotte, you had to become a fan of either Duke, uh, North Carolina, uh, or NC State in, in no particular order. Uh, what side did you choose, and, and can you kind of explain that? Yeah, um, because I have 
sincere sort of Christian Christian beliefs. I had a problem with North Carolina State because it, it seemed for a number of years they had to, to cancel Christmas programs because they couldn't find three wise men or a virgin. Um, but um, the Duke question is a, is a harder question because, you know, if you wind up going to Chapel Hill, as I did, and you're there for a long period of time, you know, being a Christian's hard then because there, there is someone you really do hate, and it's, it's anybody associated with Duke basketball. So it, it's the way it turned out. And, you know, being a good, old, good Southern boy you know, growing up outside of Charlotte, there weren't a lot of Southern people at Duke University. Most of the people at Duke University were uh, people who had come down from the north. And I wanted to go to a real Southern school. <laughs> I, uh, having a brother who went to Wake Forest uh, and growing well, that's up. That's okay. And, and, Our president went to Wake Forest. And growing up in Kentucky, uh, I, I don't think I can really support either of those. I actually had them turn the game on, uh, the Please. UK game on. So, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> again, you said you attended North Carolina in Chapel Hill and stayed there uh, for nine years, earning your bachelor's degree and PhD. Uh, you, have, you have spoke with uh, – our director of athletic communications, Brad Moore, about seeing games in the uh, now called Dean Dome uh, and fell in love with the sport of basketball ever since. What players do you remember during that time uh, and who is the best player you've actually ever seen play live? Well, I was there from 1979 to 1988. And that was, you know, right in the middle of that period is when Carolina won, I think it was their second national championship, if not their third. But, you know, that was the year when... Uh, Michael Jordan was sure. there, and you may remember uh, uh, Worthy and Absolutely. Perkins. And, but, but I think the best basketball player I ever saw was Michael Jordan. He was phenomenal. I mean, he was a phenomenal athlete, and he was a special basketball player. He, he, I, you know, people may want to make comparisons today with LeBron James or, right. or whomever, but I can tell you that Michael Jackson – he was something special. When you saw him in person, particularly the first year I was there, um, we were still playing in Carmichael Auditorium. So it was a, it was a smaller right. smaller venue, and the Dean Dome came later. But, you know, when, when you're in that cozier, cozier area and that you've got a superstar, he was a superstar. Now, uh, you know, Dean Smith played – team ball and Michael Jackson was a superstar so I mean Michael, Jack Michael Jordan was a super Michael Jackson was, he was a still a superstar at the same time Woo. okay um, but you know Michael Jordan could could do everything and that didn't always mesh well with team basketball so I, I think Michael Jackson learned a whole lot from from Dean Smith about playing on a team and it made him a better player now you moved to Salem in 1995 and have you're now on your 16th uh, school year with Roanoke College. Uh, you've seen many students come and go, uh, but some of them being basketball players. Do any of those uh, players stand out in your mind that you remember watching here over the years? I do. I mean, I, probably Paris Butler was a student who came through and took both of the organic chemistry courses, went on and has had a successful uh, start to a great medical career. And Paris was a good person, and he was a good guard. I mean, he was, he was great out on that basketball court. And uh, I think more recently, I, I, enjoy, I really enjoyed watching Curtis Perry. I enjoyed watching somebody who worked hard. Curtis Perry worked hard on offense and defense, never left anything behind. And when you're in the stands watching, you appreciate that. Now you talk about, um, you know, having players – go on to uh, the starts of successful medical careers. Is that something you enjoy about being at a school like the Division Three? that, you know, for some players it's not necessarily – athletics is not necessarily going to be the next thing after Division Three. Is that something you can enjoy to see uh, former players and students of yours actually move on to be successful, you know, in the medical world and in other places like that? Absolutely. Um, you know, for the most part, student athletes – are very disciplined. So the fact that there is a large chunk of their time that they're not devoting to studying, you know, they're, they're devoting it to practicing and, and, uh, and playing games, 
if they're going to be successful in the classroom, they have to be disciplined. They have to be good time managers. Sure. And uh, through the years, I've seen quite a number of those. I've seen in, in all the sports that we have at Roanoke College. So, you know, far from it being, you know, some some professors might think it's just a detriment. It's it's not. I mean, that to some students, it it rounds out their whole person, and that's sure. part of what Roanoke College is about. Absolutely. Now, before uh, we let you off the set here, uh, we'd all like for you to kind of explain uh, the quiz bowl uh, and and uh, who do you target to be in it. Quiz Bowl is a question-answer competition. If you could Im imagine Jeopardy played by teams with teams representing a, a college, that's sort of what Quiz Bowl would be, would be about. So what we want is uh, students who enjoy that kind of competition. Lots of high schools have academic competitions. So we want students who enjoy being part of that team, who have fun practicing. You know, we practice questions sure. and answers, and who have good recall, who have a great command over one area of knowledge. You don't have to be great in everything, but if you're great in one thing, that's, that's good enough. Now, what, uh, what's kind of the collection of, of schools? How, how wide is the uh, spread of, of teams that are in the quiz bowl? Oh, throughout the country. I mean, Roanoke College has been to nationals only once. So we actually went, and we were one of the top 11, 12 uh, colleges in the country. And we're talking about competing with University of Michigan, University of Virginia, Harvard, University of Chicago. So one year, we had our one year of glory where we went to the Nationals. We didn't win, but it was in Manhattan, Kansas, out in the middle of the state of Kansas. You know, they told us we were going to Manhattan. I got excited. <laughs> But it was Manhattan, Kansas, and that was less exciting. But it was good. It was good to be out there with with the students, and you know, just as much as our current basketball players love to play that basketball, we have some students at Roanoke College who love the academic sure, competition. I can imagine. Yeah. Well, good luck on on getting to that second uh, national championship, and thanks for or not national championship, but at least two nationals and. Um, thanks for being on the show, and come back anytime to talk basketball with us. I will, as long as you don't say anything good about Duke. Oh, okay. that, that's that's a guarantee. Okay, <laughs> we'll be we'll be right back in just one moment with men's basketball assistant Terrell Johnson. Stay with. Mac and Bob's opened for business in 1980. Over the years, we've grown from 10 stools to a full-service restaurant that seats 330 people. Now we invite you to come try our new breakfast menu, featuring sweet potato pancakes, eggs benedict, omelets made to order, stuffed French toast, homemade sausage and gravy biscuits, and much more. Open for breakfast Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m., Sunday brunch 10 a.m. till 2. See you for breakfast at Mac and Bob's in Salem. with men's basketball assistant uh, Terrell Johnson. Now, welcome to the show, Terrell. Uh, thanks, man. It's nice to be on. Very nice to be on. Now, you're coming on the show as a coach for the first time after playing for the Maroons last winter. Uh, as a post presence that was considered the workhorse of the team, uh, how has the transition been for you uh, wearing a suit instead of wearing a jersey this season? Honestly, I'm not going to lie. It's been a little tough. I, I thought, you know, after four years of college basketball, you're like, man, I don't really – I'm done with it. It wasn't like that first couple of games, man. I really would have gave anything to be on the court, but I'm getting used to it now. I like it. It's not bad. Now, taking a look back at your career before Roanoke, uh, you spent your first two seasons playing under uh, Clay Nunnally at, at Randolph College. Uh, now, this wasn't like any normal situation for the men's basketball team at that time. Uh, your first year playing for the Wildcats was the first year that Randolph uh, was a co-ed institution. Uh, could you tell us what it was like uh, for you and your teammates playing for a brand-new program? Well, I was kind of used to it when I had gotten to high school. Uh, Riverbend is a new school, too, so, I mean, I'd play there. We didn't do great our first year, but uh, Randolph was definitely, definitely a new experience. The thing with Randolph was is that it was a co-ed. It, it went co-ed. It was started off um, all-girls school, and uh, 
one thing I didn't know before I went there is that the girls <laughs> really did not want the guys to come <laughs> over there. So that was like a big surprise. So we pretty much had to be on our best behavior because we were in a, like, a pretty tiny microscope because they didn't want us to be there. They wanted any excuse to get rid of us, you know what I mean? So we had to do whatever. We just couldn't, just had to stay out of trouble. Had to be the best role models pretty sure. much. Now, you spent two years at Randolph, and then you decided to transfer to NAIA school, Southern Virginia, uh, which started their transition to Division III uh, in 2009-2010. Uh, though not in the ODAC, you were still very familiar with playing against ODAC opponents, uh, it's, as Southern Virginia is. Uh, your, your best defensive effort was a career-best 14-rebound performance versus Eastern Mennonite on December 12, 2009. Uh, as a junior, you were a member of the SVU squad that finished 16-9 and and second in the USCAA National Tournament. Could you tell us how it was playing in a national tournament for the Knights? Uh, it was it was nice, man, real nice. I didn't really – before that, I'd never been in anything like that. I mean, AAU tournaments are kind of like that, but it's – like that, it was unreal. And was, I never had, like, the position where I was the starting center. So then that was a real big thing. And it's just – with that, I just wanted to play my best, man. You know what I mean? I was glad to be in position, blessed to be in the situation I was in. So I just wanted to play my best and just hopefully we would win. I was praying we win. Now, entering your senior year, uh, you attended your third school in four years at Roanoke College. What made you want to attend Roanoke College to complete your to complete your degree and play basketball for the Maroons? Well, uh, at first, honestly, I thought I was going to Stevenson University. Uh, I'd planned to go there. I'd like halfway through my year at SVU, I decided like though I liked I liked SVU the basketball program and like the school overall. So I'd planned to go to Stevenson, and then at like about a month before I was supposed to go there, everything fell through. So then I was just like. Man, what am I supposed to do sure. now? <laughs> so I end up uh, having to look at schools because, honestly, I didn't want to play basketball anymore. I just wanted to go to school. Sure. Uh, so I had to go look at the schools that were still just accepting people, and it was between uh, Bridgewater, Emory, Roanoke, or back to SVU, and Roanoke definitely by far seemed the most <laughs> appealing out of that bunch. Now, as a senior, you became known as a tough physical presence in the post uh, while a defensive leader on the team. You posted a season-best 10 points, hitting 3 of 5 from the floor and 4 of 4 from the line uh, with six boards to lead the Maroons to a thrilling overtime win at Bridgewater. Can you take us back and tell us a little about that game uh, and how you felt leaving Harrisonburg with the big ODAC victory on the road? <laughs> it's kind of funny that you say that game because I remember that game probably the best I'd ever every game last year. Well, well, leading up to that game, I think we were on like a two, maybe three game losing streak. And I was just like, I was kind of ticked. I just didn't, I was just mad. I had uh, Melvin, Felix, you guys remember Melvin, Matt, they came up to me before the game. They're like, why are you so mad? I'm like, man, I'm just tired of losing. We look, in practice, we looked like we were just messing around. We didn't look serious. And obviously, we came out the game and we were down by like almost 20 at a point. And I was pretty much the only one playing good. So I just tried to keep us up until Melvin. Melvin finally hit his stride. Then, uh, Corey hit that, like, 40-foot three to set overtime. It was history from there. Now, uh, we talked a little bit at, at the top of the interview, and now coming back to it, now entering your first season as assistant coach, what do you notice differently being on the other side of the fence? Uh, you pay a lot more attention to detail. You really don't think – you know what I mean? You really don't see how much coaches put into it. You really don't sure. – you're not grateful enough for it. Uh, I've gone to a couple games, like three-hour drive games, just to scout a team, and you know, I mean, I mean, that's a big commitment. Just to scout a team, it's not yeah. even a thing. You really don't, you really don't appreciate it as much. You really don't. But now I, I'm a coach, and I really do appreciate, you know, the things that I had other coaches do for me. Sure. Now tomorrow night, uh, Roanoke will be playing uh, Randolph Macon at home. Could you talk a little bit of, about that contest and what and what you're looking forward to? Uh, Macon's a real tough team, man. I think they might be number three. Like in so. the conference, they just beat, came off a huge one, being Hampton, Sydney. I know uh, Lamar Giggett's on their team. He's, I played with him at high school. I played against him. He's a real good lefty, real good player. He's doing some real good things for him. We're going to have to we're gonna have to come out to play tomorrow. They got good, good post guys. They shoot the three remarkably well. They got three guys shooting over 40% from three, and that's kind of unreal for any, any division in college basketball. So we better come out to play. We better come out with energy or else things might get ugly. Well, Terrell, good luck uh, with the game tomorrow night, and thanks for joining us. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's nice to be on. We'll be back in just one moment with men's basketball player Clay Lacey. Stay with us. 
Be sure to catch Roanoke College Sports on Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7 in Roanoke, Salem, Botetourt, Lexington, and Blacksburg. Brought to you by Mac and Bob's Main Street, Salem. For programming information or schedules, go to valleyvisiontv.com. With men's basketball player Clay Lacey. Clay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now this is this is a special night uh, to have you on, as both your high school and college coaches will be joining us on Tuesday Night Live tonight. Uh, you're a homegrown grown product of the Roanoke Valley, and uh, following your high school coach's footsteps and attended Roanoke College. What was the deciding factor for you to s choose to stay at home and play for Coach Moyer and the Maroons men's basketball program? Well, the first one was gas prices. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, I figured why why go anywhere else when, you know, there's a great college in the uh, Roanoke area, great coach. And, uh, you know, I, I used to come to Roanoke College basketball camps when I was a kid. A little kid used to come, and uh, Coach Moyer was still running them. And uh, so it's just kind of – it's been cool to play in a gym that I, I'm familiar with. And um, Roanoke's a great school. I was looking for something good academics, and I wanted to, you know, play in a competitive basketball conference. And the ODAC is definitely one of the most competitive conferences in the country. So, um, you know, I figure why go anywhere else when uh, what you want is right here. Sure. Now, coming out of high school, you have, you've tasted that championship feeling not once but twice playing for Coach Billy Hicks. <laughs> Uh, in your final two seasons playing at Cave, at Cave Spring High School, you led the Knights to back-to-back -to -back VHSL Class AA state titles. What kind of confidence did that give you entering the college game? Um, you know, it gave me a good amount of confidence. You know, we played against a lot of high-level competition, whether it was AAU or high school. Um, you know, just getting to the state championship the first time, I feel like we played against a lot of good quality teams coming from the River Ridge District. You know, that's one of the tougher, uh, if not the most tough, district and double a in virginia i feel like so um you know just playing against good competition and playing with good competition we had five starters on my high school team that i felt really could have played college basketball so um it was it's in our our high school program is really almost run like a like a college program so uh i just think the program and and playing against the the good level competition that we did in the playoffs and whatnot uh really helped with with coming here and and being ready to jump right in now as a a 6'4 swing man playing alongside now Vanderbilt center uh, Josh Henderson. You nearly scored 1,000 points and pulled down over 500 rebounds in your high school career. Uh, you were named the state championship player of the game, scoring 21 points in your final high school game. Can you describe to us uh, that game specifically and the journey it, it took uh, to get to the state title game for the second straight year? Oh, yeah. That game actually uh, was really tough because I didn't hit a single three in warm-ups. I missed all my threes in warm-ups, so I'm going in the game – you know, like, well, you know, I didn't make any warm-ups, so I got to make them in the game. And luckily I did. Um, you know, I think it was, you know, great looks by my teammates. And uh, I just happened to be the one that got hot that game. But uh, the run there in general was great, especially the second time, because the second time, you know, everybody's gunning for you. Everybody knows who you are. You won it last year. Sure. You know, you got the star player going to uh, – going to play SEC basketball. So it was all, it was, you know, more fulfilling the second time almost just because um, it's like everybody's trying to stop you. And even though they're giving you their best shot, you still did it. So it was uh, really, really a magical run and something I always have to look back on and remember and cherish. Now you were a part of, a part of a good recruiting class that came on campus for the 2010-2011 school year. Uh, as a freshman, you earned significant playing times. You helped lead the Maroons to 12 wins last winter. Uh, which doubled the win total from the previous season. How comfortable did you feel uh, as a freshman playing against bigger, stronger, faster competition uh, in one of the toughest conferences in the country? Um, you know, it was uh, it was definitely an adjustment from the college or for, to the college game from the high school game. Definitely a different level of competition. And definitely uh, higher higher skilled players and whatnot. But uh, going back to high school, you know, we played in a really good district and we played a lot of good competition on our way to the uh, state championship games. And I played AAU for years, so um, you know, I was I was a uh, I was looking up for the challenge, but you know, it was um, it was definitely 
definitely different than, than high school, but it was a good experience. It was a good uh, level up. Now, this season you've had five games in which you scored in double figures, including a career best 14 twice in wins over Covenant and Goucher. Uh, you've also seen yourself win rebounds this season as you've put on some extra pounds of muscle in the offseason. Tell us what you do in the offseason and the preseason to prepare for a year of basketball. Well, uh, one of the things about this offseason was I feel like my freshman year I got beat up a lot. Uh, I feel like I would get pushed out of the way for rebounds and, you know, people would just be – uh, getting rebounds on the boards that I know that I could have had if I would have had, you know, a couple more pounds of muscle. So that really, uh, that really motivated me in the off season. Just hit the weight room hard, and I did a lot of uh, calisthenics, like body stuff, like push ups, pull ups, sit ups. And uh, but that was, you know, probably one of my main focuses in the off season, just to get stronger. And uh, it's uh, it's helped pay off a little bit this season. Now. Uh, you've also seen success uh, in the classroom with a high GPA, which earned you a spot on the 2010-2011 ODAC All-Academic Squad. Uh, with a demanding class, uh, with demanding classwork and practice and game schedule, how do you manage uh, your time on campus uh, during the school year? You know, I think it's all about planning for stuff. You know, if you can, if you can have a plan of what you're going to do during the day and say, I'm going to do this, and then, I'm, and uh, it's about priorities and goals too. You know, you got to prioritize what's most important to you, and you got to say, well, these are the things I can get done today, and these are the things I can get done tomorrow, and if I really need to, I can wait till then. You know, you got to know what's due when and what you have to do when, and uh, you know, a lot of it's just time management and. Uh, just knowing when you got to do things. A lot of studying on the bus. Yes, a lot of, a lot of bus reading. Now tomorrow night going up against Randolph-Macon. Uh, how do you feel going into that game? Um, you know, we feel, we feel confident. You know, I feel like we can beat any team in the conference, uh, and uh, it's that type of conference this year. There's not one team that's, that's not beatable. And, uh, you know, we're, our mindset right now is just taking it one game at a time not looking ahead and not looking behind. We just got to worry about the, uh, the next task at hand. And uh, Randolph-Macon's a very good team. They're really good in the transition. So we're definitely going to have to step up our transition defense. And uh, I know it's going to be a battle. Last year it was. We had them in the ODAC tournament. And uh, we didn't do too well against them during the regular season. But we gave them a dogfight then. So hopefully it'll be another one tomorrow night. Well, Clay, thanks for joining us on the show. Good All luck. Right. Thanks for Tomorrow having me. Tomorrow night we'll have that game uh, right here on maroons.roanoke.edu, uh, and we'll be back in just one moment with men's basketball alum Billy Hicks. For information or schedules on Valley Vision TV programs, visit us on the Internet at valleyvisiontv.com. Remember, you're watching the Valley's only true local network, Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7. Mac and Bob's opened for business in 1980. Over the years, we've grown from 10 stools to a full-service restaurant that seats 330 people. Now we invite you to come try our new breakfast menu, featuring sweet potato pancakes, eggs benedict, omelets made to order, stuffed French toast, homemade sausage and gravy biscuits, and much more. Open for breakfast Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m., Sunday brunch, 10 a.m. till 2. See you for breakfast at Mac and Bob's in Salem. Be sure to catch Roanoke College Sports on Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7 in Roanoke, Salem, Botata, Lexington, and Blacksburg. Brought to you by Mac and Bob's Main Street, Salem. For programming information or schedules, go to valleyvisiontv.com. And we're back with men's basketball alum Billy Hicks. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, you're a proud hometown product of the Roanoke Valley and have been here your entire life. Uh, you were a standout at Cave Spring High School as a 1984 graduate. Uh, has the gym and school changed uh, since your prep playing days for the Knights? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's changed a lot. You know, it's been a long time. And uh, I guess the overall facilities, you know, we have uh, different bleachers, different backboards and rims. You know, the floor's been painted. Uh, we have a team room now, which we just dressed in the old cold locker room. So from a facility standpoint, a lot has changed. Now, do you have a, a, a memorable game from your high school career? You know, probably the most memorable game that, um, that comes to mind would be my senior year home, home game against Patrick Henry. We were AAA then. Uh, we hadn't beaten Patrick Henry in probably 10 or 11 years and, and beat him twice my senior year, beat him on our home floor. Um, you know, I can just remember – you know, driving home and people were celebrating. And, of course, it was a packed house. That was the big rivalry then was K-Spring Patrick Henry. So, um, you know, I think uh, I had a pretty decent game, and it was nice to nice to finally beat those guys. They sure. really whooped us my <laughs> sophomore and junior year. 
Now, you're a three-year letterman uh, for Ed Green and, at, and the Roanoke College basketball program from 1984 to 1987. Uh, now, while playing for the Maroons, you were part of three straight ODAC championships and three consecutive NCAA tournament appearances. Uh, you played with some stars during that time, which include uh, Reggie Thomas, uh, James Penix, and even your former assistant and teammate, Chris Morris, uh, which we had on the show on January 10th. Could you tell us a little about your experience playing for such a powerhouse program during the heyday of Maroons basketball? Well, it, you know, it was tremendous. I mean, we were I, – first of all, let me let me make sure that this is clear. I did not play very much. I guarded those guys in practice a lot. Uh, I was a, a role player, to say the least, but – um, it was a great experience just going through the whole thing of being recruited to play college basketball. I thought that was pretty cool because it meant a lot to me, you know, when I was in high school and uh, coming to, to a program, I think, you know, my senior year, uh, they played in the uh, Final Four or, or, or Final Eight and, you know, seeing them have such national success. You know, obviously when we were here my freshman year, we had two first team All-Americans, uh, Shane Abernathy and Reggie Thomas. And, I guarded Reggie a lot in practice, or he dunked on me a lot in practice. But, you know, his senior year, he was probably one of the top five basketball players in the state of Virginia, and that includes the guys at UVA, the guys at Tech. I mean, he could play. Um, James Penix was a uh, still a very close friend of mine. He and I guarded each other in high school, and I came in and took one look at him and said, well, I'm going to be his backup. <laughs> so uh, he, he was a great player, but it, it was tremendous. You know, we got to – Got to fly to our regional games in the uh, in the NCAA tournament, and they actually used to refer to the ODAC tournament as the Roanoke Invitational because it was played in in Salem, and Roanoke College won it for the first 12 years that they had it. So, um, it was a tremendous experience. And in in the 1986 uh, ODAC championship photo, you're holding the championship plaque in the middle. How much uh, did that mean to you uh, that your teammates wanted you to hold that during the during the photo? Well, it's it's it was great. I mean, you know, it was one of those things I look back on now, and and um, you know, I probably played 34 seconds in that game, and uh, you know, my teammates. I think uh, the thing that meant the most to me is I knew I had the respect of my teammates. They knew, first of all, that it meant a lot to me that I was a team guy. You know, I was all about what the what the team was going to do, and um, you know, secondly, I was a good teammate and I worked hard in practice, and I, I think it was just kind of a reward. They're like, here, you you hold this. I mean, they had the glory of playing, and and uh, you know, so it was a, it was an honor to be up there, and it's up in the in the hallway at the Bass Center, and you know, my kids have seen it, my players have seen it when we've gone over there. They make fun of the the '80s hairdo and all that stuff, but it was, uh, you know, it meant a lot to be a part of that. Now, playing in the ODAC and NCAA tournaments, and you touched on this just a, just a moment ago, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty special experience uh, and the goal for every collegiate athlete uh, or every collegiate program in the conference. Could you take us back, especially to what it was like playing uh, in the Salem Civic Center, and, and you, did, you already touched on traveling to play in the NCAAs, but that, that's something special too. Right. Well, it was, and I tell you, it was, a, it was really special to me because we played our high school district tournament at the Salem Civic Center. So for me to come back and be able to get on the floor uh, in college, uh, my, my freshman year, um, I played a lot of JV. We had a very strong JV program. And Coach Green, you know, he really recruited by numbers. I mean, he recruited a bunch of people, and, and then he would divide them up. And, and uh, so I got a lot of my experience my freshman year on the JV team, and I can remember – um, I was so excited to be dressing for the ODAC tournament my freshman year, and I got the absolute worst case of the flu you could get. I had about 104 fever and was throwing up and, and actually could not make the, the tournament uh, my freshman year. So that was kind of a bummer. So that was even made 86 when I got to hold the plaque even more special. Now, after you received your bachelor's degree from Roanoke College, you entered the world of coaching. You actually uh, had a start as a senior when you took over the Hidden Valley Middle School position before joining your high school alma mater to become the assistant coach. Uh, just two years later, you became head coach of the Cave Spring Boys Basketball Program. How did your previous playing and coaching experience leading up to that promotion help you prepare uh, for such a tough position to have at that time? Well, being a, being a player that, uh, you know, in high school, I started every game I ever played. And in college, I never started a game and never played very much. So I felt like I could relate to any player, no matter what they were going through. 
I could take the guy that was getting a lot of run and and uh, talk to him about how he had to prepare, and I could talk to the guy that works his tail off every day in practice and uh, sits there during the games and, and doesn't get a lot of playing time. So I really felt like that was going to help me. Obviously, you know, I had a great middle school coach. I had two uh, good high school coaches and, and then Coach Green at, at – Roanoke, so I was able to take in a bunch of different things and decide what would work for me. Um, I do think that p playing helps you as a coach. I mean, I think you can go through. There's guys that have been successful coaches that never played, but you know, I just really think having a feel for the game and maybe knowing what what players are, are going through at different times uh, helps. So, uh, and then the mental toughness of of having to push through and play. I mean, I can remember I got mono my freshman year before I got that case of the flu and you know, missed a bunch of time and was just so sick and had to keep up with your grades. And it just makes you mentally tough to have to go through that. And uh, to be a coach anywhere, especially in Southwest County, coaching at K-Spring, you've got to be mentally tough because people are always going to second guess you. You have to believe what you're do believe in what you're doing and your style. And, you know, I couldn't be anybody else. I could just be Billy Hicks, and I've always just tried to be, uh, you know, the best me that I could be. Hey, you've been able to see the fruits of your labor in just six years as your team, led by former Duke star and current NBA player J.J. Redick, hoisted the Class AAA State Championship trophy, uh, which was the final year uh, the Knights played in the, in the highest classification in the Commonwealth of Virginia. How was it to coach such a high-profile star like J.J. Redick and keep him in tune with the team uh, during that magical run in 2002? Well, the great thing about J.J. is he always was concerned about his teammates um, so it was easy to keep him in check. His parents were, were wonderful uh, parents and role models, and, and they made sure every day when he came through the door that his head would fit through the door. And, you know, he had to take out the garbage, and he slept in a room with his brother. He wasn't treated special. Um, you know, we didn't treat him any differently. You know, we had to make some adjustments. I mean, this was a kid that was having his high school teachers ask for his autograph when he was in 10th grade. So we had to make some adjustments with him, but he never required us to do anything special. Um, he was always the guy that worked the hardest. And when your best player is your hardest worker, then you can accomplish anything as a team. So, uh, you know, sometimes we would have to call him off a little bit. You know, he had such high expectations for himself. Uh, he played with his best friends in high school. As a matter of fact, when he got married a year or so ago, four of the five guys that were in his wedding were his high school teammates. And um, so, you know, it was a, a close-knit group, and, and they all wanted to win, and, and J.J. was the leader, and they all accepted that. So it, w it was an awesome experience. After winning the state title in 2002, and the following year, your team was circled in every one of your opponent's schedule as you dropped down to Class AA and yet still advanced to the state championship game led by a former William & Mary standout, uh, Adam, Adam Trumbauer. Excuse me. How difficult was it during that year with, without arguably the best basketball player to come out of Cave Spring uh, to fight your way back to the championship game? Well, we used that as motivation because we said, you know, everybody thinks that we won just because we had J.J. And we had a lot of other good players. But, uh, you know, so that next year we had some guys coming back that we felt, you know, we had four guys in specific coming back from the 2002 team that had played significant roles. Uh, Adam Trumbauer, like I said, was a Division One guard. Andrew Davison um, went to Binghamton Division One school and then transferred and finished his career at Emporia State, which is a good Division Two school. Uh, Jake Kaplan was a 6'7 kid inside that ended up playing at Brandeis for a couple of years. Um, so, you know, we had some, and we had our starting point guard back from the 2002 team. So we knew we had a good nucleus, but we only finished third in our league that year. That was our first year in AA. They combined the, the Blue Ridge. There was like 11 or 12 teams, and Blacksburg had three Division One players on their team. We split with them, ended up on a coin toss, finishing third, and uh, went, in the, went in the tournament came out and played um, Allegheny in the regional finals. They had Montel, Watts, Wilson, Montel Watson that went to, um, uh, went to Elon and had a great career, 1,000-point score there. And we shut him down and, and uh, went on and, and made a run and really had a great opportunity to win that state championship game. Lost by two and, and missed uh, you know, 12 three-pointers and 13 or 14 free throws. And wow. you know, We were right there. Uh, keeping your coaching principles in track, stressing fundamentals and, and team first concept. Uh, Lightning didn't strike just twice, but three times as you guided a star studded team, uh, which featured Vanderbilt center uh, Josh Henderson and Roanoke College sophomore uh, and guest Clay Lacey to back to back state championships. 
How special was this group, uh, which became the only class to win back-to-back -back state titles? Well, this group was, was unbelievable. You know, we kind of saw these guys when they were freshmen. Clay transferred in as a sophomore and added that missing piece. Uh, you know, we just had these, these five guys that started for three years, basically, had played together for so long, but they were just better people off the court even than they were basketball players. And, and it was just, uh, you know, winning makes everything easy and fun. I mean, coming to practice was easy because we were winning and, and uh, you know, preparing for games was easy because we were winning. And, but the bottom line was is we just had a great time with each other. And that was, that was you know, three Clay's sophomore, junior, and senior year are, are three of the, you know, most enjoyable years I've ever had coaching just because – um, those guys were so great to work with. Uh, now you coach with your older brother, uh, which could get testy at times because of being brothers, uh, of, because of brothers being brothers. How has your relationship with them grown over the years, and how has it benefited? Uh, how has it benefited you uh, and your program? Well, it, it, you know, we've been together for so long. He's my big brother, but uh, you know, the thing I love having him on the bench for is he's not afraid to tell me the truth. You know, sometimes some other guys, some of my younger assistants or whatever, will tell me what they think I want to hear. And uh, my brother Bob has always been the voice of reason, and he'll look at me and say, that's not working. Why are you doing that? Or that, you know, he'll look at me in practice several times. He's looked at me and said, that's, that's the dumbest drill ever. If We should never do that drill again. <laughs> Whereas, you know, no one else could really get away with right. saying that. And, and so he, he always keeps it real and, and keeps it honest. And he's been a great asset to us over the years. He's, uh, you know, he's right there with me on the bench every game. And um, every once in a while he has to miss a game because of his job. And it just drives me crazy not having him there. Uh, so, you know, he's got a lot of basketball his experience. Um, his daughter, my niece Sarah, was a was a great high school and college basketball player, and um, he's been with the game a long time. Been with me 15, 16 years. So, you know, it's it's great having him there. It's something you know when we've when we've won big and won the state championships to to share that with, uh, you know, the person that you're really close with is awesome. And Coach, we appreciate having you on the show. Thanks for coming on. We always enjoy having alumni on the show, and uh, hope, hopefully you'll come back. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks again, and we'll be back in just one moment with men's basketball coach Paige Moyer. Stay with us. If you would like to sponsor this program or advertise on Valley Vision TV, call us at 540-397-1051 or email to sales at valleyvisiontv.com. Remember, you're watching the Valley's only true local network, Valley Vision TV, Comcast Channel 7. basketball head coach Paige Moore fresh fresh off the road yes I uh, ran over to uh, uh, I was supposed to talk about where you go in recruiting and all those things but uh, about an hour away see a good high school game of course the game went overtime so I was late running back but sure. I appreciate y'all holding the spot for me well, we're glad you can make it now going back over the last week uh, your, your team got back on the winning track against Randolph last week uh, in the middle of what was a, a tough stretch of games uh, playing four games in one week uh, with classes starting and changing routines, uh, it can be difficult for students uh, to get used to. How do you help your kids adjust to the changes uh, of the start of the second semester uh, while also keeping them focused on conference games and preparing them uh, during that hectic week? I think it's a lot better for them to be back in classes. I think when you're laying around at Christmas and we had a lot of home games instead of road games, they get tired of that. They need the routine. Absolutely. They need to have reasons to get up in the morning other than basketball. And so I think it's great to be back in school. It's great to have the vibrancy that everybody else brings back when they come to campus. So uh, we're excited about it, and I think that's a plus and, and not a minus in any way. Can you talk just a little bit of, about that Randolph game and, and the importance of, of kind of the swing of things? Well, you know, they've had a good program the last two years. They've really gotten competitive, and uh, I want to start playing my home games there because we're 3-0 and in Randolph's gym. 
And uh, it was a great win. We played from start to finish our best game of the year, no questions asked. Uh, we, we, we really took control of the game early, and it was a great back-and-forth game. Uh, we got a 9 or 10-point lead, but, of course, when you're on the road playing against a good team, they're going to come back and challenge you. And Randolph came back, but we withstood it at the end and uh, really walked away with a good three-point lead. And our best victory of the year, uh, no sure. questions asked. Now, some players are making a name for themselves uh, in the run at college rec- record books, uh, quasi uh, Amplin size preparing to enter among the top 10 all time at Roanoke in career steals, uh, while Logan Singleton is six in career block shots and is only 95 points shy of being the 33rd player uh, to reach 1,000 points. Uh, they're among the best scoring duos in the conference. In fact, uh, looked it up actually today, still uh, the top scoring duo, just uh, 1.1 points against uh, the, the next set. Uh, how important is their performance uh, to be above average night in and night out? Well, they're huge for us, and we, and we try to get them shots, and they're a focal point of our offense and trying to get them the ball and get them better shots, and we need to continue to work on that. I mean, that's uh, uh, one thing that we've, we've not done as well as we need to is uh, get those guys to do what they're doing. They had that third person in the scoring column. We've had different guys step up, but nobody's done it really consistently, but Jack Hamilton, Clay Lacey, got a lot of other guys who can score some points on the board. We just need to make sure we – we uh, add something to what those two guys are doing because they've been consistently good all year on Absolutely. the offensive end. And uh, it's neat that Quasi's going to enter the steals, Mark. Uh, and we've had some very good defenders in that, a bunch that played Fred Green and myself. And uh, Logan will be a fine member of that 1,000-point uh, sure. He can really shoot. I'll miss his scoring next year. Now, you, you recently made some uh, some lineup changes, uh, starting senior Adam Kessler for the fourth straight game and uh, Daniel Eco the last two outings. What did these two players show you to – uh, to make the starting lineup change, and, and have you seen to change for good? Well, yeah, we might still mess with our lineups a little bit. I think Adam just kind of deserved to, to finish his senior year in the starting lineup. He's really done some good things coming off the bench, and really bringing Daniel into the lineup and Adam, we, we moved some guys who we think are better scorers. And I think one thing we lacked early on is we think sometimes we went to our bench and we didn't get scoring punch, and I think – with some guys that, that, like Clay and Jack especially, you're putting guys on the bench that will come off and really give you some good offense early. So we'll have balance on the court at all times uh, when we go to our bench. So we're still looking for the perfect lineup. We haven't found it yet. Uh, it's a work in progress. But I think uh, you know Daniel and Logan playing together is a nice imposing way to start the game. Absolutely. And I think – uh, one of the reasons we wanted to go with Daniel is because he is our best low post scorer. He takes up a big body. He, he'll kind of set the tone of the game that's going to be physical if you're playing us. And so uh, we think Daniel's just uh, ready, to, ready to take on that that, that starting role. And uh, I think it really helps us coming off the bench too, though, because we've got two of our better scorers coming off the bench now. And, he, and uh, Daniel had a, a, a nice uh, performance in the last uh, home contest as well. He did, uh, both at Randolph and here. He got some points, some rebounds, and just mixes things up. And uh, he's a high-energy player. I think he's already becoming a crowd favorite too because of how he, he bangs, sure. and bangs and works in there. Now, uh, coming tomorrow night is a tough contest against Randolph-Macon. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, with, uh, with Clay and, and Terrell about it. Can you kind of uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the contest that's coming up tomorrow night and, and well, – Sure. What it'll be like. <clears throat> They've uh, had a great year, probably a surprising year to a lot of people, but they returned uh, two very good veteran guards, Calvin Krosky and Adam Desgain, and uh, they were 30-minute-a-game guards for the last two years when they were in the Final Four and ranked in the top five. So those guys bring a ton of confidence back for them. And they've got such good young players. They recruited extremely well the last two sure. years. So they were ready for graduation. Again, they dropped a little bit as far as maybe talent level uh, or experience level. Their talent level is pretty much the same. The experience levels drop. But, uh, you know, their, their teams are more up-tempo than they've been before. They're a little more guard-oriented. Uh, we think we match up well with them. We're going to have to play 40 great minutes of basketball. We're going to have to play as well as we did over at Randolph to uh, have a chance to pull this one off, but uh, we're shooting for it. Actually coming into the house with uh, the current uh, ODAC uh, Men's Basketball Player of the Week as well. So uh, yep. definitely going to have – definitely will be running on all, all cylinders. Well, we're looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a team you've got to beat if you want to get to the top of the ODAC. And we've been disappointed in our first half record – I think we're, we've played well at times and haven't been rewarded for it. So I told the guys, hey, let's, let's concentrate on the last half of the ODEC season. We've eight games left. Let's make something happen. And no better opportunity to start than playing one of the top teams in the ODEC and Randolph-Macon. Absolutely. Heading, heading down into the, the home stretch here. It is. It's hard to believe it's uh, almost February. And, uh, you know, this is the exciting time of college basketball. Absolutely. And, 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 again, we've, we've not played as well as we're capable of, but I'd rather be a finisher anyway. So sure. hopefully we can make some hay down the road here. 
Coach, we appreciate you being able to make the show with us tonight. Appreciate y'all waiting for me. It's a pleasure to be back, and thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of this on television, seeing Billy Hicks, Clay, Terrell, uh, Sammy, and uh, his, his, you know, he, he's, he's one of these, the highlights of, uh, of Roanoke Athletics when he gets on TV. He's better on TV than he is in the weight room, I think. But it's good to be back, and I'm looking forward to seeing the show on television this week. Well, Coach, good Thank luck you. tomorrow night. Appreciate it. Thank we'll you. be back with Dave Sampson for Sampson's Meets of the Week. Stay with us. And we're back with strength and conditioning coach Dave Sampson for the ever popular Meets the Week segment. First time I've done this with you since uh, probably the second show. I know. It's been, you've been away for a while. Welcome back. Glad Come on back into the family. Circle of trust, Richmond. <laughs> Circle of trust. And we are going to start uh, this week's Meets the Week with women's basketball. And it, I believe we only have uh, one nominee, Tatum McKee. That's correct. Tatum McKee. Uh, I was courtside for their last outing and was really impressed impressed with Tatum's just absolute desire to, to, to do everything on the court. She, she shot well. She rebounded well. She played defense well. We got eliminated a couple turnovers, but the reason I got her up here is seemingly every time that, that she might have turned the ball over, she hustled back. And, and somehow, and I'm not sure how she did it, she got the ball back just about every time. So that, that's impressive. That's doing the dirty work. There was one play in particular – Tatum, uh, I think she took a shot from three-point. Uh, the young girl blocked her shot, was going down for a layup. Tatum hustled after her, passed her, back-tipped it, jumped out of bounds, threw it back in off the girl, and we got the ball back. So I, I think I looked at Brad at that point and said, well, there, there's, there, there's my player of the week right there. She did a heck of a job. So, uh, and, and I understand that the, the, the girls played well tonight. And so that's why Tatum's winning. That's her, that's her, it's her trophy. Picked Come on up, down and get your T-shirt, Tatum. Pick their, picked up their third straight game in a row. Absolutely. I'm a, proud of them. They're a, on a roll. A streak, if you will, according to Brad. Um, now moving on to the men's basketball side. The men's side of the house. The, the guys are playing hard. They're working hard in practice. They're working hard in the weight room. Uh, number one up, let's start from the bottom and work up. Tyler Akers uh, does extra work with me three days a week. Uh, we're trying to put a little little size and strength on him. He's a, he's a future contributor to the Maroons. Um, and Daniel Eco has been an absolute workhorse in there. He's, he's done a great job of not being a hatchet man. You know, we talked about the one week he had four fouls faster than any human I've ever seen. But uh, he's doing a good job in the paint, playing offense, getting rebounds, and playing defense, taking up space and being a force in the middle. 
and I, I like what he's doing in there as well as he's, he too is spending some extra time in the weight room. So my hat's off to Daniel. That's why he's, he's nominated. And Quasi on Ponsai, you know, you think of him as one of our leading scorers, but uh, I talked to Coach Moria over the past uh, couple days, and we got Quasi up there simply because if you ever come to one of the games and watch him, poor Quasi takes a beat. He gets knocked all over the court, and he doesn't get frustrated, doesn't show emotion, never gets upset. He, he just continues to hustle and hustle and hustle, and so that's why I got Quasi up there. Scored uh, 29 point, or 27 points in the last contest, 19 of which were, of which were in the second half, so always staying through the, the entire yeah, 40 I mean, minutes. Yeah, it's a heck of a job. Quasi, you, you know, he, he starts out playing hard at the beginning of the game, and he also finishes with, at the final seconds of the game. He's playing every bit as hard as he does in the opening, in the opening of the game. So, um, and that in itself is why I'm going to give Quasi the award. He's a first-time winner. He gets the uh, Meat of the Week T-shirt this week. Quasi picking up the win this week, and hopefully the basketball team picking up another win uh, tomorrow big, night. Big game. We big got our, our guys have got to step up, and they got to play, play well. we got to eliminate the turnovers, the errors, and I think if they play hard, it's an excellent opportunity for the guys to go out and get a big, much-needed victory. Absolutely. Tomorrow night, the middle face-off against Randolph-Macon at 7 o'clock in the Bass Center. Halftime will feature the Krispy Kreme Donut Eating Contest uh, with some great prizes. If the Maroons can come away with the win, it will be their 1,300th, making them just the 20th team in NCAA Division III to do so. Uh, the women will host Guilford on Saturday at 2 o'clock and take on Bridgewater at the Bass Center on Tuesday at 7. And that is going to be the end of our show tonight. Anything you want to leave the people with? I'm a big Krispy Kreme fan. I don't know if anybody out there knows that. I can, I can just about eat my weight in Krispy Kreme donuts. Right. And a little known fact, a little known fact, when you go by the Krispy Kreme place on Melrose, if the sign's on, fresh donuts. Absolutely. Always a plus. You've got to like fresh donuts. Abs everybody likes fresh donuts. Absolutely. Fresh, fresh Krispy Kreme donuts when the light's on. Come on out and get your donuts tomorrow night. It's going to be a good show. The Maroons going to go for a big victory. For our technical director, Reed Hall, our sports information director, Brad Moore, athletic director, Scott Allison. Uh, for Nick DeSactus, who had to leave us early, I'm Merson Bramblett. We'll see you in two weeks.